my angels. All right, everyone, welcome to WellMed Charitable Foundation Caregiver Teleconnection Series. Today, we've got Cynthia Hazel with us to talk about mindfulness for caregiver stress reduction. And Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I uh, have that in my slide, but I'll go ahead and share a little bit. I've, I've been a caregiver. Let me tell you all, I've been a, I was a caregiver to my mom for 12 years. And, uh, and it was just her and I, her husband had passed away and I moved in to care for her. And it was a great experience for me. I learned a lot about being there with her in a different time in her life. And I know the highs and the lows of caregiving, and I enjoy bringing that to presentations because I've been in your place. So, so are we ready to start? Looks like we're ready to go. Okay. So I've experienced stress, but I don't know about all of you. I don't think I'm alone though. <laughs> Because most of us would admit that we've experienced some type of stress. It's common for Americans just in general, not even caregiving stress, but we are on our phones, we're getting notices, we're exposed to activities in the world 24 seven. And what makes it stressful is we can't do much about what happens. We simply witness it, maybe make a comment, but we're not running it through our body and releasing it so we can have a lot of stress build up. But today we're going to be talking about family caregiver stress, and that's different because you're caring for someone who has an illness, injury, or disability, and you are working it in with all of your family responsibilities too. So it feels like a double load. And it can be rewarding, but challenging. It can harm your relationships. You don't mean for it to, but if you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot and you come home and then you have more to deal with, Sometimes, you know, you wind up responding the way you wish you hadn't. So we're going to look at how mindfulness can help you live differently. And what I'd like for all of you to do is experience just a touch of it right now. This is a very simple, mindful, meditative experience. And to do this, if you choose, sit up straight in your chair, feet flat on the floor, uncross your legs. And just close your eyes and begin to breathe deeply in and out. Let's go back one slide, Minerva, thank you. No, let's go to the first slide. First slide. Thank you. Now what I'd like you to do is pull up a happy memory and just deal, uh, think about that happy memory. Take it in, drink it into your body. Just feel it, notice it. Notice the environment. Notice what's going on at the time. Who are you connecting with? And we'll just spend a minute with that. All right, and please open your eyes. I know we gave you a little exposure to it. If you were able to spend at least five minutes with it, then you would probably have more of an experience. But you see, mindfulness doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple and it can truly help. And one thing that's really important to know about mindfulness is that it's not a religion, it's a practice. So anybody can learn at any time. I love Dr. Mark Hyman, he's a functional medicine doctor and he's already put support behind mindful meditation and seen what a great job it does of reducing our stress. Okay, next slide please. So I stepped onto the healing path after experiencing two major automobile accidents and then dealing with a lot of pain. 
and living with those after effects, everything I learned, everything I experienced, I put that all together and I use it to inspire others. I have a mission and it's, it is designed to give you the skills to reach your potential by recognizing your value, expanding your knowledge and broadening perspectives. And when I give presentations, I do a variety of inspirational topics like gratitude, forgiveness, loving others. And I'm currently working on a class about the value of joy. I also have several mindfulness classes, but today we're focusing on the one that most of you are experiencing most of the time, and that is how do I reduce my stress and still take care of the one that I love. So I do personalized sessions with people if they want a private opportunity to heal, heal their heart, reconnect and strengthen their relationships. And if you have any interest in my services, you're welcome to ask me at any time and uh, I'll be happy to, to tell you what I do. And I have, uh, I think we can do that at the end. So next slide, please. I thought it would be really good to start with a definition of stress. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to find out that a gentleman named Hans Sell in 1936 described stress as a non-specific response to the body in relation to any demand for change. Mm -hmm. Also, good stress is defined as a burst of energy that basically tells you what to do. And I will point out that we all need some level of stress Otherwise, we wouldn't even be able to get out of bed because we would be, we'd be slugs. So we do need it, but we don't have to go through debilitating levels. And what we're going to do today is talk about ways to easily calm that stress and still be able to care for the one that you love. Because I know you have a lot of demands. And I know that stress can cause emotional and physical stress. Without realizing it, caregivers, you're putting your health at risk. So it's common for you, it's not unnatural, it's very common to feel angry, frustrated, worn out, sad, and often feel alone as you're the only one doing this and it's, it's very frustrating. Other symptoms to look out for, just in case you see this happening, so you'll know what is what may be coming. You could feel burdened or worried at times. You might gain or lose weight. You could even lose interest in activities that you used to enjoy. You can have frequent headaches, other pains and health problems. And this could lead in some cases to misusing substances like alcohol or drugs or prescription medicine just to get you by. And when we add all of this up, probably you may be setting aside your own health mm -hmm. and missing your medical appointments because you're trying to manage what's going on with your loved one. So right away, we can see that too much stress can harm you. And this could lead to maybe not getting the amount of sleep that you need at night, not eating a balanced diet, just eating something on the run. And that too can have an effect on your health. Okay, so next slide, please. So I thought I'd spend just a little bit of time and help you know about this beautiful body that we all have and tell you about the, the system that's going on when our body is in a stressful situation. Because when we look at the nervous system on the left side of the body, around the side of the temple, is where the sympathetic nervous system is located. And this is where the, your response to stress would be fight or flight. If you're under stress, it's an emergency. If you are upset for any reason, whether it's real or it's imaginary, you may freeze up. And when you're freezing up with fight or flight, you're making a decision. Am I gonna fight or am I gonna run? Now, these are just survival situations. 
And fear can create such a tension in our bodies that we don't breathe. And you can think about it, if something happens, first reaction, uh, your reaction might be, and of course we're holding it all in and we're not getting that full breath of air that we need because what we perceive or believe and feel these feelings flow over to our mind and body, which are both connected. So you can experience a similar situation when you grieve because a wounded or broken heart, you're also dealing with loss and dealing with shallow breathing. So shallow breathing would mean that you are breathing from the upper cage up in the area under the neck and on the shoulders, and you're not really getting the breath down into the full extent of your body. But when we go to calm ourselves down, you know, we don't stay stuck in the stress. Our body starts right away trying to calm us. And on the right side of our body is the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's where the body begins to rest and digest. And it controls the body's responses and helps us regulate all the normal organ functions. So here we are with fight or flight on the left, we have rest and calm on the right. And what happens is when we begin to heal, the vagus nerve kicks in and that's the longest nerve in our body. So it runs from the sides of our brain all the way down to the middle of our body and down to the abdomen. So when we think about that, we can see why all the organs are engaged because it's running down that path and it's sending calm, which helps us return to center and ground. They call it, the body calls it receive, achieving vagal tone. It really doesn't matter what it's called, but that's just what the body goes through. So the result by doing all of this and knowing this is that calm people do a better job of managing their energy and they're better able to focus on the job at hand and work more effectively. And that's the situation we wanna be in all the time. But if the techniques I'm going to show you will help you get back to that situation, if you find that you are feeling extra tense and and need some help. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, folks, you can do go to the chat room if you have questions. Somebody did say, commented on the fact that they really liked that you said that it was not a religion, but a practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was great. Anybody? Well, right now. I like to stress that for people so they won't feel like it's going against their faith or anything. No, it is strictly mm -hmm. a practice. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So let's look at mindfulness in general as the alternative for stress. It's interesting that mindfulness began as far back as 1500 BC and it started with religious groups and they were using it and exploring it as a practice, but it's expanded beyond that. And today, secular groups, religious groups, all types of groups are using it again for the practice side. It has nothing to do with religion. Now, mindful.org defines mindfulness as the basic human ability to be fully present and aware where we are and what we're doing, not overly reactive or overwhelmed with the, our environment and what's going on. To reach this point is very important because you're calming down the chattering aspects of your mind, which we all know as the ego. And boy, can it chatter. If we're not used to it, the minute we start trying to do something that's calm, it's just over there, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I mean, what's going on? Shouldn't you be doing this? Shouldn't you be doing this? And you want to bring yourself back down and say, no, we're going to focus in a different way. Seniors at home recommends mindfulness because you're involving acceptance and it requires you to notice the thoughts and the feelings you're having without putting any judgment on them. You notice, but you don't have to say, well, that was right or that was wrong. You learn to guide your thoughts through what you're experiencing in the moment 
And the bottom line is you enjoy more peace of mind. Being mindful means to observe, not to change or suppress your thoughts, feelings, and sensations. And this will help you focus on the task it's at hand instead of maybe you're trying to do something and then you're thinking, well, I should be over here and I should be over here and I should do this. And oh, yes, I have to get lunch ready and then I need to do the wash. And then I, you know, no, you want to come back to giving your full self to the moment. Now, what another program that emerged out of mindfulness in general is called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. And the acronym for that is MBSR. And this was created by a doctor of medicine named John Kabat Zinn in 2003. And what I like about the program is it's evidence based and it's a self care strategy. And so you can go back and look at that and see how it is effective for reducing compassion fatigue and stress. And that also helps because you know it's not random, you know it's not something you're making up, but it's already been proven. Next slide, please. So when we get into the components of mindfulness, one of the first ones that I wanted to share with you is the importance of being fully present. Have you ever noticed when you focus on stress that you become more stressful? <laughs> Instead, focusing on the present helps you achieve whatever you have to do in the moment. What you begin to learn by practicing the power of now is that's the only time that you have power. So being present doesn't mean you have to do something formal. You don't have to you know, be in a certain posture. Just be aware of what's happening right now. And when you do that, when you feel overwhelmed and you can bring your total self two activities, but you feel stretched and you're going here and there. No, stop and just bring yourself back to where I am now and what, what are you doing? Because staying present changes how you see the world. Now, it's funny that I'm gonna share this next part because we all know it, but sometimes we forget. You're never gonna find more time in the day but this is something you can do being present while you're doing your chores, doing the dishes, other chores, or you can even practice while you're taking care of your loved one. So how would you do this? First of all, do one thing at a time. When you're aware of your care partner, let's say for example, you're caring for them, bring your whole self to the moment and try slowing down so things won't be so hectic. You are focusing on the experience you're having with them in the moment. Also engage your senses. Notice what's going on around you. Watch the light coming into the room. Feel the warmth of your loved one's hand. Because claiming mindful space for yourself will help you keep grounded and peaceful, but it'll also bring a quality you to the experience. And there's very likely that you'll have a better relationship with the one that you're caring for as a result. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about mindful breathing. You know, breathing is very interesting. It's an autonomic experience, uh, practice, but it's the only thing that we can control in our body. We're seeing, we can't, you know, we either see or we don't, but with breathing, we can actually change the way that we do. And there's a reason for that because when we're breathing fully, we're oxygenating our body. So again, we talked about it earlier, when we're stressed, we, we tighten up and we freeze, 
but mindfulness works for breathing because going back to that side of the body I talked about, the amygdala portion of our brain is there and that's the one that's getting busy and tell them you have to do something right away. You need to run or you need to fight. So when we can calm down, this reduces the fear and cortisol levels in our body. And that's important because letting ourselves get to that point, our body becomes more inflamed and that affects our health. Then our immune system is benefited by reducing this and we're building up and our brain allows information to flow to the right part of brain it could, should go to for us making good decisions. Now, mastering mindful abdominal breathing affects your body and changes the way you cope with stress. So if you're mindfully breathing, then you're going to find throughout your day that healthy chemicals are flowing and your stress levels are reducing. So you start by allowing yourself to take a few minutes to relax and breathe deeply. Fill up your body with air all the way down to your abdomen. Let it go easily by just exhaling all that air and then repeat. Place your intention on how it feels to go through those different levels of breathing. And if you're going around and wanting to deep breathe to calm yourself down during the day and you're with your loved one and you're doing things, I would suggest deep breathing over mindful breathing because you can just be breathing deeply and relaxing where mindful breathing has you holding for a few minutes in between breathing in and letting go. And so what you would do for mindful breathing, if you want to follow along with me, is you're sitting up straight again, like we talked at the beginning, feet flat on the floor, leg, floor legs uncrossed. And as you breathe in, breathe all the way in from the abdomen. If you're not used to that, that might take some practice, but you breathe in all the way, then hold for a count of four, and then breathe out fully because you're letting go of that air, which is now stale. <sighs> Over time and practicing this, you're going to get better and better. I mean, don't be surprised if your body is not used to it at first because you've been doing survival breathing probably for a very long time and didn't even think about it. But breathing and relaxing and letting go of that stale air will help you bring more oxygen into your body throughout the day. And then you'll be able to do a better job of caring for your loved one and doing everything that you want to do. If you are deciding to develop a mindful breathing practice, let me suggest a few things to you. I would say choose a time when your loved one is otherwise entertained, they're sleeping or someone is with them and you have a little time that you can take to yourself and go to another room where you can sit quietly, maintain this posture that we're talking about and spend at least five minutes practicing the breathing. At the beginning, that's all you really need to do. Then you can go back to your tasks and you'll find that you're feeling a lot better. As you go along, after you get to the point where five minutes you've got it down and you know it, then consider going for a little more time, maybe 10 minutes a day if you can. But this is a great way to have you doing something without having to say, well, I need to hold all this anxiety inside of me and then I'll go do something when I get off of the duty. Okay, any questions about this? We're gonna go along and talk about it in another instance too, but I wonder if you have any questions. Okay, folks, <clears throat> if you are on the phone, please uh, just unmute, uh, press star six, and I have a website where I can see that. Or if you're on Zoom, you can put your hand up. You can go to the chat room. We'd love to have your questions. We'd love to have your input. Any suggestions that you might have to go along with, you know, what Cynthia is talking about. And I will send some uh, some resources after the the talk. 
because I can give you the John Cabot Zinn uh, referral and also Andrew Wheel, who's the one who actually did evidence-based um, research on the on that breathing technique. He called it the four seven eight breathing technique, and it's and it's evidence-based that it reduces stress. So these are these are both really good resources I can send to you. Anybody? Anybody with questions or comments or? Okay, not right now. Let's go to the next slide. It's also very important to be kind to yourself. Have you ever asked yourself, what do you enjoy that's relaxing and renewing? Do you like to take walks, ride a bike, listen to music, take a bubble bath, or maybe even just read a good novel? Thinking of self-care as necessary is important because you are developing a strength within yourself that will translate to the one that you care for. Mm -hmm. Caring for yourself and you're making that a priority and then that will spill out to caring for your loved one. It won't be the same level of, I'm putting out all this effort, who's gonna take care of me? You know, that needs to come back to us. So, the loving kindness meditation is similar to the breathing, but you're approaching it from more of a mental stance. So on loving kindness meditation, it's important to choose a phrase and you want to think that phrase silently as you breathe in. Then your focus is the phrase that you selected, the one I'm going to give you right now is, may I be calm and peaceful. <clears throat> so you're <clears throat> breathing in and thinking to yourself, may I be calm and peaceful. And then you're holding for at least a count of four. And then as you breathe out, you breathe out all the stress related to the opposite side of being calm and peaceful. So breathing in, thinking, may I be calm and peaceful, holding, and then breathing out. <sighs> so with loving kindness meditation, you can practice it for a couple of minutes. You're in that environment I, I, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier where you're by yourself, so you can devote at least five minutes to this. So in the last half of doing this exercise, change your focus. And I suggest that you send loving thoughts to the one that you care for. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're caring for your mom and her name is Mary. So you would change your phrase to be, may Mary be calm and peaceful. You think that as you breathe in, hold, and then breathe out all this tension and stress associated with Mary not being calm and peaceful. Now, devoting five minutes of time to this helps regenerate a connectedness inside of you. You're taking care of yourself and then you're taking care of your loved one. And it focuses and it develops inner peace and emotional wellness. There's a bonus with this, which I love. And this technique is especially successful for those who are coping with the strains of long-term caregiving. Because practicing kindness meditation enhances the area of your brain involved in emotional processing and as a result also reduces negative thinking. Once this meditative habits of practice, you will find you're better able to forgive and self accept. So this will again translate not only to the one that you care for, but all of your relationships. And I have another idea you might ponder. Instead of trying to fit this in during the day, you might think about practicing this loving kindness meditation before you even go and do your, your caregiving duties, because that way you'll have a lot more energy for the day and maybe you won't feel as rushed. Okay, next slide, please. 
It's also very important in all of this to connect with others. That shouldn't come as any surprise that we humans are social beings and our interactions help us remain connected and it encourages mental wellness and physical health. So part of the component for that is to focus on developing healthy relationships and friendly relationships. And they have a benefit. There is a reason and a payoff for doing this. And that is that having friendly relationships increases your sense of belonging and purpose. It boosts your happiness while it reduces stress. It improves self-confidence and self-worth. And it helps you cope with traumas like serious illness, job loss, or death of a loved one. It encourages changing or avoiding unhealthy lifestyles such as excessive drinking or lack of exercise. Mm. The bottom line is, I suggest you don't take on the challenges of caregiving by yourself. Call your family or friends and tell them, I wanna be able to call you on occasion and just talk to you. Don't worry, you don't have to fix anything. You don't have to advise me on what to do. I just need you to listen. If you will just listen and I can share, that will really be helpful. And I'm sure you'll find someone who's willing to do that because they also love you and appreciate what you're doing and they wanna be there for you. I think that's a great idea and it brings them into the mix. So they're involved in a certain way where they weren't able to be involved before. Now, another thing you might think about is joining a caregiver group. And that's what I love about WellMed because you have so many wonderful activities and you're there for the caregivers. So you might want to think about maximizing your relationship with WellMed and see what other things you could be involved in. Or if you look around in your community, you might find a mindfulness-based stress reduction class that's being offered in your community. And that would be something fun to do. But most importantly, make time for laughter because laughter lightens your emotional load and it reduces your stress levels. And find ways to involve your loved one in laughing because that's going to be healthy for both of you. And that would be something that you could enjoy. And both of you would increase and feel a deeper sense of joy as a result. But you know what? If you need to take a little time off, do that. Find someone to come in. Take your place once in a while because that might be all that you need and you get refreshed and then you can go back to the duties. Okay, next slide. <laughs> or is this is important because it's always important to make a connection. Because like the little parakeets are telling us, sometimes in life, we just need a hug. No words, no advice, we just need a hug. Okay, why? Well, be hu because hugs boost happiness levels. And they do that by releasing oxytocin, which is our body's cuddle hormone. That's the body's ability to promote relaxation in our one and get calmness from what's ailing us. So your cuddle hormone increases feelings of trust, devotion, and bonding. And wouldn't you say that newborn babies need a lot of hugs? Mm -hmm. Of course they do, and, and you do too. So it was really important and how we came to understand this better in the world was back in the 1900s when or some orf orphanages were operating they weren't picking up the babies as often. So they went in and they did studies and found that by not picking up the, the babies, their stress levels were extremely high. So this helped us to realize the value. It's not just a, it's a feel good mechanism, but it's not frivolous, it's actually there and good for our health. 
Even a 10 to 20 second hug has powerful benefits. So right now, when I'm talking to you about a hug, I would like for you to hug yourself because if nobody else is around and you need it, I say go for it. All right, you take your left hand, put your left hand on your right shoulder, <laughs> take the right hand and put it on your left shoulder and then hug. And let me read these benefits to you while you're holding on. All right, even a 10 second hug reduces your stress response. It engages your immune system. So you're gonna to start to feel better. The body kicks in and it naturally protects you from illness. Hugs also release bodily endorphins. Why is that important? Because endorphins in the body block pain pathways and help us to improve circulation. And then it also lowers your heart rate. So that you can get out of a 10 to 20 second hug. Okay, so let's take a deep breath. And then we put our arms down. Feels good, doesn't it? Next slide. Another mindful way which you can help yourself is to practice gratitude. Dr. Robert Emmons of the University of California is the world's greatest researcher on gratitude. And he describes it as an emotion that affirms goodness in your life and encourages you to appreciate and then repay the good that you've received. So naturally giving thanks helps us feel more upbeat and being grateful for what you already have attracts more goodness and then produces these wonderful feelings of appreciation, peace, and joy. Besides, when we're having a bad day and we can devote ourselves to a little gratitude, it's gonna change the outcome just almost every time. And an easy way to practice gratitude, if we look at this lady on the screen, go outside, be in the sun, soak it all in, relax, nice cup of tea, and just look all around and breathe in the beauty of the world around us, giving thanks for what we have been given. Another way you can do it is to start a gratitude journal. Now, a gratitude journals are simple. All you need is a spiral notebook and a pen or pencil. So every day, write down one thing that you're grateful for and then start to make a list. You have all these things. And so when that you're having a bad day, you can go back, look at your list, recall all the reasons that you were giving thanks. And this can change outcomes, change your mind, lift you up, help you feel better and give you peace of mind. So just seeing these words help you realize that joy is possible even in the middle of overwhelming caregiver responsibilities. Okay, next slide, please. So I'd like to summarize and tell you that mindfully reducing stress works because the methods we've discussed today can be used at any time. The key to incorporating mindfulness requires simply making a commitment, setting an intention, and then practicing consistently. Now, one thing I wanna to mention to you, if you're already dealing with a great level of stress and you are having so many things that you have to do, I'm gonna recommend that you choose one of these areas that I recommended to you, these options, so you're not overwhelmed because you can go back and you can focus on that. You can develop it and get it to be a real definite habit with yourself. So it's not upsetting and it doesn't break up your day. It actually makes it better for you. Don't try to overwhelm yourself. Also remind yourself, it's important to show yourself compassion when you're learning. Just begin again. We don't have to be perfect. You're learning, nobody else is around, so just enjoy. 
because your goal is not to think negatively, but to reduce your stress. So when you find that stress is taking you over, remember to take some deep breaths, center and ground, make time for a quieting thought, because as Dr. Kabat Zen recommends, it's indeed a radical act of love just to sit and be quiet for a time by yourself. And if you need someone to come in once in a while and take over caregiving responsibilities, again, that is not failure on your, your part. That's good judgment because you need to take some time away and refresh. You'd be amazed what something simple like that would really help you. But also in summary, be patient with yourself and remember, you don't learn to relax, you practice. So please don't think of mindful meditation as a chore, but as a gift that you give yourself. So do we have any questions at this point? Uh, we would love to have you <coughs> talk to us. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a little website here and it says that Kathy Hartle would like to talk to you. Okay. Is she on chat? Kathy? Let's see if we can get her on get her on the phone. Kathy, are you there? Well, she opened up her line, but um, here she is. Sorry. Oh, sorry, that was an error. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she'll think of it later. But, you know, I want to tell you, I, her mic's not working. Sorry, oh. Kathy. Do oh. you want to just type in your whatever you might want to say? or And I can pick it up. Oh, it was just an error. Okay. I wanted to, to respond a little bit to your thing about laughter. I live alone and work alone. And I love to laugh. So I've started laughing at myself a lot. <laughs> it's like if I go to empty the trash... And it seems like every time I'm putting it in a bag from a trash can, half of it falls out. I used to get mad at myself and now I just laugh. Oh, look, I did it again. <laughs> it is, I, and it makes it makes life very pleasant, you know, where you can just laugh at yourself, I think. It's very important. It's very healing. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't until I took mindfulness training that I ever said the words to myself, I love me. It was a, yes, you were right I love, love you. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I love that too. And I have another exercise in a minute. I think we all can enjoy, but I love that you said that because that is so important. I think Kathy put something in the chat. Yes, I facilitate a dementia, dementia caregiver support group and I'm always reminding them of and practicing mindfulness with them, but I'm not hearing they practice it regularly. Anything I can do to be more encouraging. I would say, uh, I don't know how many different types of mindfulness you're using, but you could focus on one and just stay with it with them every time and help them develop a love for it while you're with them and, and keep encouraging them to do this on their own. Just and maybe a set time, like you said, in the morning before you get out of bed, just, mm -hmm. you know, spend a couple minutes for yourself on yourself. That is a very good idea because it becomes part of your routine. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for asking, Kathy. That was a wonderful question. Yeah. Okay. And um, the other thing is, I think that if you get if you set up a routine. So here's an example. My physical therapist told me when I get up in the morning, I've got this really crummy back from many years of abuse. And she said, do a roll up in, in your bed and count to 100 every morning before you get up. So I do that. And instead of like going sort of wobbly to the bathroom, um, I walk straight just because of that one little exercise. So just setting aside time to do that. And I think we have some more. Uh, I think what Kathy is saying that uh, she's not always able to do this. And so you're concerned about it becoming a habit. But one thing about mindfulness is that it is uh, about relaxation. And so when you're encouraging, I would gently occur, encourage them to do it and allow them to be responsible for 
setting up a time, just create a desire in them, but let them do it naturally because this won't, um, will only stress them further if they feel like they have to do it. You know, I have to do this, I have to do this. And Minerva, I have two more slides. If we can go back to the presentation. <laughs> Those are wonderful suggestions. Thank you, Evelyn, for sharing. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. So I've, we've talked about a lot of mindful ways to reduce stress. We played with the concept and we discussed options. Before we close, there's one more exercise I'd like for you to do because this is a wonderful way to increase your sense of self. Now there's two ways to do this. If you're by yourself in the evening, stand in front of the mirror, look deeply into your eyes, and then I'm gonna give you the phrase in a minute because it's the same phrase that you would use for the other side, which would be, if you have a partner at the end of the evening, encourage them and you sit down across from each other and you take turns saying this phrase. But what you want to do, regardless, is look deeply into the mirror if or look deeply into your partner's eyes and take turns saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this encourages gratitude and thankfulness. It helps you appreciate yourself and your giving and receiving. And it's important for your health, the ones you care for and your relationships. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you for letting me spend this time with you and share some mindfulness techniques that you can use to reduce your stress. We went over many exercises, just find one that you're drawn to and give it a go because it will help you feel a lot better. And I want to thank you, Evelyn, and thank WellMed for the wonderful programs that you offer to caregivers because you are giving them opportunities to connect and to be comforted and to definitely know they're not alone. If you decide to reach me, you can go to my website at heartsonghealingplace.com. I also am on Facebook and LinkedIn. On Facebook, I have two group pages I operate. Anyone is invited to join. The first is called Grateful Hearts, where I write about what I'm grateful for in my faith. And then Heart Song Healing Wellness Tips is where I just offer wellness tips that you can think about, add, talk to your doctor, and maybe you can combine that in with your approach to your health. So, I thank you again for spending this time with me and I wish you well as you begin your mindfulness practice. And I'm gonna close now and turn it over to Evelyn, but I wanna to say to all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You always do such a beautiful job, Cynthia. Now I know Cynthia mentioned a few things um, that you might need or that you might wanna look into. And I wanna give you some resources for those. You know, if you need respite, I know we hear so many times people can't afford to pay for respite because it's very expensive. It's, you know, $25 an hour minimum these days. And, you know, maybe that's just California, but I don't think it's much cheaper anywhere else. Um, so what you can do both for to find support groups, to find whatever kind of caregiver resources you need to find you know, the respite care that might be available. Some, sometimes the Area Agency on Aging has some respite money that they can give um, to individuals um, to find online and chat rooms. You can go to eldercare.gov, you know, eldercare.acl.gov, um, which has a huge computer that covers the United States and has all of the lists of the services available for people who are providing elder care. You don't have to be an elder person, you know, to, to get onto it. And they have a website, www.eldercare.acl.gov. They also have a phone number. And during the week, the business week, there are live people there who look up, put your, your um, zip code in and can look up services that you would like to um, 
that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a respite, if you're looking for a support group, I also would encourage you if you have, if you're working with a person with dementia, any kind of dementia, the Alzheimer's Association not only has a list of online support groups, it also has a chat room. And I don't know about you, but I love chat rooms because you can put something up there. Maybe nobody's looking at it right now, but then you can go back and you can say, oh my God, I can't get mom to take a shower. She won't take her clothes off. She's giving me a hard time. You know, what do you do? Does anybody have helpful hints? And somebody will come on and say, oh yeah, you know, ever sit on the toilet, give her a wash rag, you know, just very practical sorts of things that you can learn from other caregivers. So you may want to look at that too. I will um, send uh, that elder care locator information. 211 also has can get you to your AAA. I will send you the uh, John Cabot Zen information, the 478 Breathing by Andrew Wheel. And is there anything else you'd like me to include? I want to share something. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Let me lower my hand. Um, my family's not really a huggy person, mm-hmm. but I've realized that and you'll find these pretty much at all the stores. There's these squish mellows. They're very big, squishable teddy bears. Or, And I just love squishing those. Whenever I need a hug, I just grab that and I'll hug it. I like it. You do. <laughs> That's a great idea. Oh, whatever works. That's right. Why ki- That's why kids love those little stuffed toys so much, because they can hug them and kiss them and and play with them and, you know, have attention from them. It's, okay, well, thank you for that, Minerva. And I have wanted to tell people, too, we still have two upcoming presentations this month. Um, we have one on, let's see, tomorrow. And this one's in Spanish. And it is, uh, let's see, I, I did this once, um, to practice a good quality life is the is self-preservation for those who are caregivers. And I think that just kind of goes along with what Cynthia was just telling us. And it's about our quality of life, how we're feeling in here. Next Tuesday, we've got frontotemporal degeneration, what it is, what it isn't, and what are the signs and symptoms. And that's with Sharon Hall, who's an expert in that. And I just want to say, you know, for any of you who are old like me, they used to call that Pick's disease which I just found out. I thought it was kind of an interesting find. Anyway, I would like to thank you all so much for being with us today. Um, I want to thank you, Cynthia, for the wonderful presentation. I want to thank the caregivers for what they do every day. Such a hard job. Absolutely. I want to thank the WellMed Charitable Foundation for the fabulous time and energy and money that they spend to put together these presentations, to run their clinics, to raise funds to be able to do this. They work so hard to really bring resources to caregivers and we've been so fortunate, you know, to have them in our lives. And with that, I'm going to end the recording unless anybody has one last comment. We have a minute. Somebody in the chat is saying, how do I listen to the presentation from April 30th? (laughs) www.caregivertelleconnection.org. And you can listen to millions, well, not millions, but a treasury of chats um, there. And you can, of uh, podcasts, and look for anything that you have questions about, um, any kind of topics. And that's really a wonderful resource at this point. And I think we've been recording them for two or three years now. And they're all by experts in the field. So thank you all so much. Thank you. It was good to see you again. You too, Cynthia. (laughs) Okay, take care. Okay, bye-bye now.